Hi everyone and welcome to a brand new week. It's our Monday TNT, no shortage of stories. Now we hope you had a good weekend and thank you to those people that joined in on our live program on Saturday and also the support you're giving to our new program on Sundays called Grumpy Old Men, episode two. We'll put a link in the description of today's video if you didn't catch that, just in case you'd like to. And uh, on to today's stories. This is just a quick recap on a story we did on Saturday. The PM vows no more coups. And this being reported in the Bangkok Post. Let's see what the Prime Minister said. So the Prime Minister Prayut chan said there would be no more coups, saying the 2014 putsch was the last in an attempt to allay fears as the general election nears. It's the question he gets at every single media conference now, I suppose reasonably so. Will there be another coup? He was the person behind the last coup, so I think it's a reasonable question that he needs to answer. But did he answer it? Asked if there'll be another coup. If he cannot return as Prime Minister after the election, he said, who will stage a coup? Of course, he could have said no, but he didn't. Asked again whether there would be another coup, he said, I already said a long time ago that the 2014 coup is the last. There should be no coup again. There should be no coup. Again, he didn't say no. Now, I mentioned yesterday in a YouTube short that there are probably three reasons there won't be another coup. Uh, So I'll just repeat those. Firstly, that the current army general has said there won't be another coup. He said that three times in the past five months. Now, he won't be the first general of the army that's said there won't be a coup and then gone back on his word. But that's what he said, and he'll have to stand up to media scrutiny and the scrutiny of the population if there is another coup. Secondly, I just don't think there's any mood in the Thai population for another army intervention. At the end of the day, we've had nine years of newer, younger, probably better educated people coming through the system. They're now going to be voting in the next election. They've also been more inclined to get out and protest if they're not happy with the things falling their way. I think that will have an impact on the army's decision to intervene. And thirdly, well, the army pretty much has control of the Senate. That's the, uh, the upper house in the Thai parliament. 250 hand-picked senators, mostly former army friends of the current prime minister and the head of the Palang Pracharat party, Prawit Wongsawan. So really, how much more control do the army need than they already have? So I think they're the three reasons we probably won't see another army intervention. We move on to our next story now. And the story comes from Bangkok One News and says the Thais promised no hike in electricity costs. Well, good news so far. Let's see the details. He said in the event titled The Next Thailand's Future, who's he? Uh, the event was called the Next Thailand's Future, held at Bangkok Queen Sirikit National Convention Centre. He's Super Tanapong. I don't know who he is at this stage. The cost of electricity is now 4.72 baht for residential, 5.33 baht for industrial. Now, if you're staying in a condo or even in a villa, you might be paying more for your, your electricity because often the landlords will load the costs, the unit costs of the electricity. According to him, we still don't know who he is, the ministry's decision to keep power costs the same for the residential and commercial sectors attempts to lessen the effects of the economic downturn on industrial operators. And when the nation's exports aren't doing well, he continued, we have to take care of the home sector's cost of living as well as the industrial sector. So I had to go and find out who Super Panatong was because this article didn't tell us. And we find the article in The Nation, there will be no increase in electricity rates from May to August this year for both household and industrial sectors, according to the energy minister, Super Panatongs. That's who he is. But then I saw the next line. He made the remark during the seminar, the next Thailand's future at the Queen Sirikit National Convention Centre. Hang on, what did the other article say? He said at the event titled, The Next Thailand's Future, oh, whoops, word for word, paragraph for paragraph, a complete copy of the article, not even an attribution, certainly very little attempt at rewriting by Bangkok One. So that article actually published four days ago by Nation Thailand. The good news is, though, that you're not going to have to pay extra for your electricity. 
And we do have to thank Five Star Marine for their ongoing support of the program. If you're heading off the coast of Phuket to any of the islands, Five Star Marine is a premium private charter and they'll take you out to any of the islands uh, pretty much on a bespoke tour. You can sit down and decide where you'd like to go on some of the... They've got a fleet of about 15 boats now. Anyway, thank you to Five Star Marine. There's a link in the description in this video. And you're on TNT a Monday. Thank you very much for your support of the program and the channel. Now, this story is from the Bangkok Post, and we'll spend a bit of time on this dissecting the other uh, report. And the report says that Russians are putting down roots in the kingdom. Again, reported by BangkokPost.com. It says visits are up, along with real estate holdings, shares in local businesses. Certainly something that's been noted by, well, all of us. There are plenty of Russian people in Thailand at the moment. And I should say from the outset, this is not a personal attack on the Russian people. And it's got nothing to do with the, uh, the war or what you might think of the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that is another discussion and there's plenty of other outlets for you to, uh, to have those chats. But we want to talk about the actual impact of this sudden influx of people from one particular country. That's the thrust of this article and the thrust of the way we'd like to cover it. Since January, over 370,000 Russian tourists have visited the country. This is according to the Deputy Commander of the Immigration Bureau, a sharp increase compared to last year, which saw about 435 Russians visit the country in the entire year. Well, more than that, it's since October, literally 100% of that 435,000 Russian visitors were since October last year. And he says, despite the influx, there's been no indication that Russian criminal figures have snuck into the country through illegal channels, noting that most legal issues involving Russian citizens were minor offences such as traffic violations. Then the Bangkok Post has prepared this particular chart and if we look at the chart, it says that last year the top five international arrivals were from Malaysia, India, Singapore, United States and South Korea and Russia coming in number nine. But again, it was all after October last year. And then this year, it's saying that the number one ranking country is Malaysia for arrivals. Well, a few things about those particular numbers. The numbers of Indian tourists has tanked. In the last two or three months, they were certainly by far the most popular tourists uh, coming to most of Thailand, especially places like Phuket and Pattaya, for, say, November, December and January this year. But the numbers have started to drop off. Those numbers from Malaysia, 503,000, do you actually think that there's 503,000 people getting on aeroplanes in Malaysia and flying to Thailand? No. Most of those Malaysian arrivals are across the southern borders. They're registered as arrivals, uh, but they're registered incorrectly because they're not actually tourists. So that chart gives a quite a skewed idea of the number of people who are coming here and spending money as tourists. Oh, just noting, by the way, that a lot of those Malaysians coming across the border might be coming for maybe a weekend or maybe two or three days shopping around Songkla, but they're literally coming across the border for a short time. The immigration chief says authorities in Phuket, Koh Samui and Pattaya, tourism hotspots known to be popular with Russian visitors, have not detected the presence of any Russian citizens. He goes on to say there are those who have been convicted for petty offences such as shoplifting and traffic violations, but they're not a big problem. Those with serious criminal records, however, are barred from entering the country. Well, they might be barred, but are they getting through? And then the Commissioner of the Tourist Police Bureau says no Russian organised crime rings have been detected amid the recent influx of visitors. Most Russians visiting Thailand, he said, are affluent holiday makers and prefer to visit seaside provinces. Large numbers of tourists will also benefit the economy. Well, both those comments are absolutely correct. The largest influx of Russians are to Pattaya and to Phuket 
at the moment. And now the president of the Phuket Real Estate Association says the real estate business in Phuket has recovered quickly as the island's popular with foreign tourists looking to escape the cold weather in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's always been that way. He said the prospect for pool villas and horizontal property projects are improving while condos are also popular among foreigners looking to invest. That pretty much covers all sectors of the real estate industry. He said that Russians are visiting Phuket in large numbers, which has helped the tourism sector here. They stay between one week and up to six months and most prefer to rent pool villas. Many Russian investors have also bought and resold them or rented them out to others. And again, before you all get lemon-lipped and saying, oh, the Russian people, they're renting out their properties. If the law allows them to do so, the law is the problem, not the Russian people. Spending by Russian tourists has boosted the local economy in Phuket. Local tourism-related businesses hit by COVID are making a quick recovery, and that is certainly the case in many sectors. And some Russians have bought cars and motorcycles and rented them to their compatriots. Same thing, if the law allows them to do so, then they're not doing anything wrong. And now the president of the Patia Business and Tourism Association said about 300 Russians were arriving every day after Thailand reopened its borders and now it's increased to five to 700 per day. Just noting that in Phuket, it's around about three to 5,000 Russian people arriving every day at the moment. Many Russian tourists spend about 10 to 20 days in Patia, he said, and Jomtiam Beach and Wong Amat Beach are full of Russian tourists. They're everywhere in Patia. Most tourists in Patia are Russians. So if you're up in Patia, if you've been there recently, please tell me in the comments section, what do you think about the current tourism mix in Patia as you're wandering around or heading out at night time? He also notes that the number of Russian tourists will fall after this month or April as many will return home and they'll be replaced with tourists from China and India. Now, this is interesting because a lot of friends in the hospitality and tourism sector have been telling me that after Songkran, the numbers are really dropping for pre-bookings. So I'd be interested to hear from you if you are in the tourism or hospitality sector, what you've uh, been thinking about this. Now I note there's quite a large contingent of people in those industries that are currently overseas drumming up business. So they've been to ITC Berlin and all sorts of other travel trade shows drumming up business for tourism in Thailand post Songkran. So how are your pre-bookings after April? And where are those people coming from? Because I think it's important for us to know. And then the same gentleman said that the main reason for Russians visiting Thailand is because they want to escape the cold weather in their country while the Russia-Ukraine war has little bearing. Well, I doubt whether that opinion is correct. There's certainly no facts to back that up. But uh, really, we're just uh, comparing opinions on that particular statement. And now the chief of the Kosamui district says that more than 100,000 foreigners visited Kosamui in January. Russians were the largest group of foreign visitors. And the chairman of the Tourism Association on Kosamui said Russian investors have invested in real estate, hotels, restaurants and souvenir shops. And then he says their businesses are beginning to hurt Thai-owned businesses as they snatch foreign customers away. So interested to hear your thoughts about the impact of one particular country uh, forming such a large tourism demographic at the moment and the impact that's having at the moment and what it might do in the future. So interested in your thoughts. You're watching TNT on a Monday. If you get a moment, just take a short moment to just go and click on that subscribe button, and that would be much appreciated. And we go to this just while I was searching through the numbers today. I found this uh, note from Phuket Immigration, which was actually published a few weeks ago, and it talks about their new drive through. Now, noting that uh, Phuket Immigration had this rather quirky drive through where uh, you're in a right hand drive car and the window for the drive through was actually on the passenger window. So you drive up and you put your brake on and then you have to reach over as far as you can to give your documents to the person in the window who then is sort of reaching out of the window and trying to reach the documents to you. 
I mean, the whole thing was just really badly thought out for a country that has right-hand drive cars. Anyway, so they announced that they've changed the drive-through. Oh, that's fantastic. So they've fixed up the problem. Well, not really. They've just moved the drive-through with the strange uh, situation around the corner to the other side. So you still have to drive through in your right-hand drive car and lean across either the passenger or the passenger seat to give your documents to the person in the window. So uh, they went to all that trouble of moving the drive-through window around the corner at the Phuket Immigration Office, but they neglected to just fix that one little thing. Then again, if you're on a motorcycle, no problem. Just one of those things. Thai PBS World reporting that Thailand will be using four measures to control forest fires and air pollution. Okay, well, this is a good positive story. What are they going to be doing about these forests, these agricultural fires, this burning off of agricultural waste? We've been whinging and whining about it for the past three or four weeks. What are they doing? Well, they've come up with a four-step plan. Fantastic. What are they? In the first step, the PM 2.5 level is less than 50 microns. All provincial units tasked with fire control must try to keep the dust levels under 50 microns. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. Anyway, in the second step, if the range is between 51 to 75, the provincial governors must take charge of directing efforts to ensuring the cooperation of all relevant units. Okay, they're going to take charge. All right, what's happening with number three? In the third step, if it goes between 76 and 100, the governor is empowered to order the suspension of any activities which cause air pollution on the recommendation of the Pollution Control Committee. So he actually doesn't have autonomy. Hello, Dina. He's actually got to go and speak to the Pollution Control Committee. And in the final step, if it exceeds 100 microns, the National Environment Committee must call an urgent meeting to resolve the problem. So there we go, there are four steps. Nothing really very concrete, I'm afraid. I got all excited about that article, thinking, thinking that they might be finding out ways to stop these fires being lit and actually putting them out. But there seems to be just a lot of talking and picking up your telephone and calling a committee. So that's from Thai PBS World. Now, another important topic for expats in Thailand, and this is affecting an increasingly large number of people, and a question posed by ASEANNOW.com, do expats working remotely in Thailand need to pay taxes in Thailand? A lot of people ask me this question. Obviously, I'm one of those people in that particular situation, and the information's been gleaned from Pacific Prime Thailand, I'm not sure if they've paid for this article to be published, but the information in the article is good anyway, and I've put a link in the description of this video should you want to know more about this particular issue. And this is the fundamental question to ask. Thailand's Revenue Department categorizes everyone either as a tax resident or a non-resident, individuals who stay in the country for 180 days or more in the calendar year are considered residents. Those who spend less than 180 days in the calendar year are counted as non-residents. Well, that's fairly clear-cut so far. Residents are taxed on their income on a worldwide basis, meaning they will have to pay tax on their income wherever it's generated. However, income generated outside Thailand is taxable only if it's paid in Thailand or brought or remitted into Thailand in the same calendar year. And that means, for example, that if you receive some dividend income in your home country, but it's remitted a full year after distribution or not remitted into Thailand at all, then it's not subject to income tax in Thailand. So these are good, straight, broad definitions that we can all start to build our knowledge about paying tax in Thailand. Then it goes on to ask the question, what if a part of my income is taxable both in my home country and in Thailand? That's where double tax agreements come in. DTAs present the same income from being taxed twice 
once by the home country and then once by the country in which the individual works or resides. And Thailand has DTAs with numerous countries, among them, blah, da, 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 including the United States, which selfishly I'm interested in because Google, being a United States company, pays uh, any money that I earn from this particular endeavor, and I actually pay tax in the United States. I had to sign a document uh, to be monetized by Google and YouTube, which means that I pay tax before the money is sent to me each month. And to our next story now, um, by the, yes, I'll put a link in the description of this video for that entire article because it's quite long and detailed, but that at least gives you some of the basics of paying tax in Thailand. And The Nation Thailand reports that Thailand's first urban rail network outside of Bangkok is going to be built from 2024. Now in Phuket, we've been waiting for a light rail for about 10 years. It's never going to happen. It was just a white elephant before uh, they even started writing about it. But this one in Khon Kaen up in northeast Thailand, I thought, well, is the government going to throw money at an urban public transport system up in Khon Kaen? And it says an ambitious plan to build Thailand's first urban rail network outside of Bangkok will come to fruition in the northeastern city of Khon Kaen. And the work will begin in 2024 on a 26 kilometre light rail system. And the light rail system will also link up with the mega high-speed railway running from China into Laos on Thailand. And I wanted to know who was behind this. A 57-year-old who's the CEO of a transport and manufacturing company called Cho Ta V. And he says that Konkan has undergone rapid development from an industrial area into a regional hub for financial, educational and administration activities. And it's home to more than 40,000 students. And the KKTT was formed by 20 local businessmen, academics and community leaders. In other words, they're going to build this light rail with money they've raised themselves. They haven't got their hand out to the government. They're going to fund the whole thing. We have money, he said. So we agreed that we would each put in 10 million baht. If that could develop Concan for the better, that's a bet we're willing to make. And dubbed the Concan model, part of the plan is to establish the light rail network as a backbone for real estate and city development. Well, the only thing I see is a problem here is that, of course, they're using public land and they're going to be taking up uh, space on streets and building, erecting building in publicly owned spaces. So he says it still requires appropriate government endorsement and support. Representatives like Suradek have spent the last eight years seeking approval from various local, regional and central agencies. So interesting story there about a private consortium banding together putting their money down on the table and then approaching the government saying, we've got a great idea, we want to build a light rail, we're going to pay for it, we just need your cooperation for use of that land. So it will be interesting to see if that goes ahead and if it does and if it's successful, then it certainly would pave the way for other private consortiums in other parts of Thailand to perhaps do the same. Good idea. And with that, thank you very much for watching today. Hopefully you know a little bit more about Thailand. Uh, thank you very much for those people that watched on the weekend. If you do get an opportunity to subscribe to the channel, I'd be eternally grateful. Otherwise, thanks for watching today and we'll see you tomorrow.